right, this is the Great War Discussion Group. And this afternoon's presentation is by Mike Burke, who really needs no introduction. Uh, his topic is the evolution of how the German army uh, fought its wars that occurred during World War I. It's a topic of a special relevance because much that they learned during the First World War was applied uh, during the Second World War. In addition, the Allies were not exactly static. They evolved their doctrines in a somewhat similar fashion uh, and for some of the same reasons. In order to deal with an entirely new kind of war dominated by artillery and trench warfare, both sides had to evolve over the course of the four-year conflict. And Mike, go ahead. All right, thank you, Charlie. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's discussion. As uh, Charlie indicated, I intend on talking about the subject that's listed here. Um, and then I'll, towards the end of it, I'll, trip, I'll attempt to identify what were the key points of the, the doctrine that they used in 1918 and how they applied it to the Blitzkrieg for that short period of time of 1940, 1941, before they allowed things to go uh, pear-shaped. So again, thanks for joining me today, and let us begin. So I would argue that uh, the, the armies of 1914 were relatively unsophisticated in terms of doctrine and tactics and equipment, but in just four short years, by 1918, they're, will, they're going to be developed into really world-class at that time military. So obviously, as Charlie's talked about, they're going to responding to the situation in the Western Front, responding to the situation in the Eastern Front, uh, responding to uh, the changes that war is bringing about. And so again, these militaries are all relatively good. Uh, they all have essentially the same sort of tactical doctrine. Uh, if you look at, I'm not that I've read their doctrine, but if, in the research or preparing for this particular presentation, uh, they essentially all have the same ideas. And, and that idea was the offense. The, the, in the French, it was the spirit of the bayonet. Uh, the idea was, despite all the technology that came up prior to the First World War, and a lot of the technology that's going to be developed during the war, you know, a man, an infantryman with his bayonet would be able to win that war. And that is the way that these, you know, these nations went to war. And to be honest with you, it really didn't change very much until towards the end when, you know, like I said, the Germans realized that um, something needed to change. And so they were able to make that adjustment. Uh, the other interesting thing that I've always, I, uh, the other thing that I've always thought was interesting was how these military, how these governments, how these militaries approached what's called the inner war years, 1918 to 1939. Um, each of them drew or uh, took away from them a, a specific idea or a set of ideas that shaped their militaries during the interwar years. So, for instance, England and America, both protected by vast oceans, paid almost no attention to their armies, but spent all of their money on their navies and a lesser extent on their air forces, uh, with the understanding that we're not going to do that again, we're not going to go fight in the trenches, and the seas will protect us from any threats. Uh, the French, where, as you all know, most of the battle on the Western Front was fought on French territory, the French said, well, if we had just a better border, if we had something dividing us uh, off of Germany, then maybe we won't have to fight in the trenches of the First World War. So as you know, they, they build the Maginot Line, that 280 mile long stretch of fortifications that were designed, one, to, uh, deter German attack it, uh, into France. And then the other thing is that they expected, you know, if the Germans wanted to attack, let them go through Belgium like they did the first time, right? But the French essentially are going to hide behind the, uh, behind the Maginot line. And then it's, but, so it's really the Germans, I think, who are going to take the, uh, the concepts, uh, the good and the bad, essentially, that, that come out of the spring offensive of 1918, and they're going to create, which everybody knows of as Blitzkrieg, you know, the idea of a lightning war, the idea of moving, penetrating, getting deeply to your opponent's rear, and then uh, causing them to sue for peace or uh, to be defeated on the battlefield. 
So that's kind of what I'm trying to capture in today's discussion is that evolution of tactical doctrine. So uh, here's the agenda, which I propose we're going to talk about. Um, as in most cases, I probably got three hours worth of uh, stuff to talk about, but I'm going to cut that down to an hour. So it's not nearly as bad as it looks like, right? And then as many of you know, I used to teach up at Fort Leavenworth and you know, the professional professor in me uh, won't let me go with the presentation without defining some topics. So I want to go ahead and describe, uh, define doctrine and I want to define tactics. And then we'll go ahead and get into our discussion uh, of, uh, of evolution of the German doc tactical doctrine. So doctrine, this is obviously from our, this is American doctrine taken from the joint publication. Of, I think the key points in this particular definition is the fundamental principles in that second line, right? They're the principles that guide the employment of military forces. So you can take out the word US and substitute anybody, any other country, but doctrine are principles that are to be followed when you're employing your military, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, and all of that. And then the other key point is down here, it's designed to provide the principles of the basic understanding so that commanders at the strategic, the operational, the tactical levels can use those forces to solve those particular problems. And so doctrine essentially provides the commander the ability to go ahead and solve problems at those three levels. And then the other thing about doctrine that's important to, uh, to keep in mind is doctrine drives everything about a nation's military. And when I say everything, I mean the following. It drives the organization. How is your army organized? How is your Navy organized? How is your Air Force organized? Are they, are they the right type of people and the right type of equipment in order to meet the strategic objectives or those objectives that are set aside by the National Command Authority? It sets up training. How do you prepare individuals? How do you prepare small units? How do you prepare commanders and their staffs in order to fight? That is all based on what do you think, what, do you, what is your doctrine? What do you think is the major threat to the nation? Material, all the stuff that you need to operate an Army, a Navy, an Air Force, a Marine Corps uh, is driven by the doctrine. What you say is the principles by which you're going to go ahead and fight in the future. Leadership, what type of leadership? How do you develop leadership? You have ROTC programs, you have military colleges. Do you have officer candidate programs? It develops and how do you train those? How do you train leadership at the junior level, non-commissioned officers? company commanders, all the way up through general officers. Education, again, how do you educate those leaders? Uh, what type of schools do you develop? When do they go to school? How do they go to school? How do they gain that education that allows them to employ the forces that you're uh, developing? Personnel, obviously it, it talks about, it drives what type of personnel you have in the service. What type of individuals are you looking for? What should their educational background be? What uh, are the things that they're expected to know and learn? What you know? How do you go ahead and, and bring that? How do you bring them in? How do you promote them? How do you how do you take care of them while they're in the service? And then the last one, obviously not the last one, but the the doctor talks about the facilities. You know, where do you where do you bring them into the service? How do you bring them into the service? Where are their bases? What are the facilities? The training areas, the education, the schools, all of that. All of that is driven by by what your doctor is. And then the last two that aren't included in American doctrine right now are in American definitions. You need the time in order to make all of this happen because it takes time. You know, if you decide to change your doctrine and doctrine's going to change, make a small minute, a minute change to any one of these items, you need time to be able to, go ahead and do that. And obviously the last thing that's important is you need to have resources available to go ahead and make the changes uh, that you need to make in these areas based on your change to doctrine. So that's kind of what doctrine, that's why doctrine is important. And then the other one is tactics. Um, before I define tactics, which surprisingly enough is an incredibly simple uh, explanation, I want to talk about the three levels of war. So in World War I, there are three levels of war. And you see that on the slide here on the left. The strategic is at the national level. So that's the strategy, strategic level. That's where the Kaiser, that's where the king and the military leaders are making decisions. Now, the tactical level, that's obviously at the lower level. That's the commanders in the fields, in the trenches, or in the, on the ships on the blockade, or uh, 
making decisions about where forces are going to be employed. And then that level between that in this period of time was called grand tactics. And that's the level between the strategy at the strategic level and tactical level. And it's the grand tactics level where you take the broad based guidance given to you by at the strategic level and you turn it into something that commanders at the tactical level can use, right? And in our doctrine, we use this, this, these three titles all the way up until the early 80s, 1982, actually, when based on our experiences in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, uh, we looked to the Soviets and the Soviet writing, and we changed the te grand tactics to the operational level. But it still had the same definition. It's just that uh, we changed it from grand tactics to uh, the operational level. And again, we're talking about, doc we're talking about doctrine at the tactical level. That's the lowest level. And essentially, I'm going to read it. Tactics is the employment and ordered arrangement of forces in relation to each other designed to obtain the commander's desired effect. So essentially, tactics is nothing more than ensuring that you have the right assets at the right place at the right time in order to obtain the desired effect that your boss has told you uh, that he needs to be affected, right? Or obtained, sorry. So that is tactics. And with that, I will, I will stop the lecturing part and go on into a little bit of discussion. Um, if you think about it, um, tactical doctrine had changed. I mean, the last big time Europe went to war was the Napoleonic War almost 100 years before. And tactics had changed over time with the evolution of uh, newer weapon systems or newer technology that allowed them to make some changes. So I briefly want to talk about a couple of those I think that are uh, very key for what happens in the First World War. So first up is smokeless powder and repeating rifles, right? And so we're all familiar you know, with the, you know, the Napoleonic era wars, the American Civil War, uh, muzzled and uh, I mean rifled and unrifled, percussion cap fired, uh, really bad powder, uh, very difficult to observe what's going on in the battlefield. So the Prussians are going to invent uh, the first uh, bolt action rifle. And this is called a needle gun. Uh, this was created in 1834, 1843, no, 1836 by uh, a Prussian gunsmith. And this is going to be the mainstay of the, uh, the Prussian army all the way through up all the way through the, uh, the wars of German unification uh, ending in uh, 1871. But this new smokeless powder meant that you know, you're, you're not going to be observed on the battlefield. Uh, the fact that it was rifled meant that you had a longer range. And effectively, the maximum effective range of this weapon was 200 meters. And so you can go ahead and do a little bit of standoff, excuse me, a little bit of standoff between you and your opponent. Um, I had another thought, but it left. Sorry, so the needle gun, essentially, uh, smokeless powder repeating rifles is the first thing. Second one is mass-produced breech-loading artillery, right? So with the Industrial Revolution and the, the development of, again, smokeless powder, uh, improvements are going to be made to field artillery. Uh, powder, uh, better shells, better fuses, uh, better communication between the forward observer and the, and the batteries themselves. And uh, obviously the things we like to talk about in the museum, the recoil system, uh, are all going to make uh, the artillery a much more important uh, weapon on the battlefield. And for those artillerymen out there, you all, as you're well aware of the fact that it's the First World War that gives the artillery the name King of Battle, right? Because they're gonna be the most predominant killing force on the battlefield. Next one up are machine guns. Uh, this is Hiram Maxim and his 1900 model Maxim machine gun. Again, with smokeless powder, which is much more efficient, they, he could go ahead and create a belt-fed machine gun, as opposed to that rotary machine gun with the Gatling gun that we were using, and it became very, very effective. I always thought it was interesting that he attempted to sell the idea to the American army who passed, and so Maxim took the, his gun to Europe, where he, uh, he toured Europe, and uh, over time, he, he created uh, companies inside of each of the major powers, and they just started reproducing uh, Maxim guns. Uh, in Germany, it was called machine gewehr. Uh, in Great Britain, it was the Vickers gun. France, it was the Hotchkiss gun. And in Russia, it was the Maxim gun. But it's all basically, on, basic, it's all around Maxim's basic design of his 1900 machine gun. Next one's are railroads. Um, a 
lot of European military observers observed or viewed the American Civil War and were quite impressed with the way that both Northern and Southern commanders could move resources around the battlefield. And it was all due to the fact of the railroad, the fact that they were using railroads to move uh, what they needed, where they needed, when they needed it. Uh, it was actually the Germans who kind of took the idea of creating a strategic level rail system that would allow them to move their forces from one end of the country to the next end of the country. Uh, Germany is well aware of the fact that they have two borders, that they have to be concerned about Russia in the east and France in the south. And so they're going to go ahead and use, begin developing a railroad system to support their war plans, which they will put to great, uh, the great use at the beginning of the war or throughout the war. And then the last one is telegraph and later telephone, right? So uh, again, military observers in the Civil War noticed how commanders in the field using the telegraph could send orders to uh, other forces on the uh, on other side of the battlefield to get them to move from one location to another. And so they're going to go ahead and uh, the telegraph and later telephones are going to allow commanders to stay in touch with their forces in the field, as well as for the forward observers uh, and uh, uh, staying in communication with their artillery. And, and then, as we know, they're really not going to use radios that much. Though. My understanding is that radios eventually were put into uh, in the airplanes, essentially, that's what they kind of did for, for the most part. So smokeless powder, repeating rifles, artillery, machine guns, railroads, and telephones, telegraphs, essentially are going to change the way that uh, war is going to be fought. Now, the Europeans had an op opportunity to see somebody use all of this uh, in a war in 1902. Correction, let me double check. That's the Sino, the Russo Sino Japanese War, 1904, 1905, where the Japanese generals used trench system, they used field artillery, they used machine guns, they used railroads and telegraphs essentially to blockade Port Arthur so that the Russians couldn't reinforce it. They kept them from uh, being able to, kept the Russians from being able to reinforce that. So the, I mean, Allied generals prior to World War I saw what this modern technology could do, but again, the idea of having to make that change or the reasons why they would have to make that change kind of kept them uh, away from using that technology. And they went into the First World War with the idea that uh, their soldiers and the spirit of the bayonet would carry the day. Of uh, that sense of offensive spirit or the fact that, uh, that uh, they wanted to attack led to, you know, to the war plans that these countries created. And so uh, I'm going to talk briefly about some of the war plans. Um, some people are familiar with Russian Plan 19. Uh, that was their basic plan created in 1902, which essentially said, we're going to send everything that we got, four army groups, 19 corps, and we're going to attack Prussia. Um, a couple of years later, in uh, doesn't really matter, 1910, they think, well, you know, maybe we've got a problem with the Austro-Hungarians since they've entered into an agreement with the Germans. So maybe what we need to do is make an adjustment for that. So they took the 1910 plan and they made a part B, which essentially said half their army is going to invade Prussia through the north and the other half of their army is going to go ahead and either attack into Austro-Hungary or protect Russia from being attacked by the Austro-Hungarians. But essentially, um, uh, this is what their basic plan that they go into. And this is what they'll execute in 1914. Uh, we're all familiar with the French plan, 17. Uh, which essentially is kind of based on their experience from uh, the Franco-Prussian War, 1870, 1871. Um, we all know that as a result of the Franco-Prussian War, they lost Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, the French assume that the, the Germans will probably attack the same way they did the last time. And while they're maneuvering through the Low Countries to attack into the western part of France, Germany, I mean, correction, sorry, France is just going to go ahead and make, whoop, make a direct attack uh, from Metz uh, in northeast or just eastward uh, to, to rapidly seize uh, Alsace and Lorraine. And then at the same time, if the situation is correct or good for them, they'll come in through the Low Countries and try to attack the German forces as they're attempting to maneuver further to the west to get into uh, Belgium. Uh, Plan 17 was kind of predicated on a couple of assumptions, <clears throat> one of which was that they were they the french were not going to worry about protecting the, the the front along belgium because their understanding was that england 
having said it, an 1840 treaty with Belgium that England would deploy an army to go ahead and uh, cover that particular flank, which is exactly what the British end up doing. And then we're all familiar with the von Schlieffen plan or modification of the von Schlieffen plan in 1914. Um, essentially, this plan, since it did work very well in 1870, and if the commander of the German forces, uh, von Mulkey the Lesser, or the June Younger, Lesser in the sarcastic term, hadn't weakened his right front, probably would have worked uh, in the front. A uh, very ambitious plan, uh, an incredibly detailed timeline, time schedule, uh, allowing them to re retrace the steps that they used in 1870. And um, unfortunately for the Germans, they made two assumptions uh, that would uh, prove uh, not fatal, but uh, kind of kill, yeah, I guess kind of killed this plan. Uh, the first one is, is that they assumed that England, or correction, sorry, they assumed that Belgium would not defend itself, that the Belgian army would stand down and allow the Germans to march through uh, unopposed and attack into France. And obviously that did not occur. And then the other assumption based on that, the other assumption that kind of hurt them was they thought that they had enough resources available to them in order to uh, accomplish the task of capturing Paris putting France out of the war and then turning their army to the east to defeat the Russians uh, because their other, other assumption was that the Russians were going to take six weeks to go ahead and mobilize. Uh, mm. uh, the defense that the, Brest that the Belgians put up uh, eventually ended up essentially using all the munitions that uh, the Germans had set aside for their offensive plan. So as we all know, uh, things come to naught and we end up having the stalemate in the Western Front that occurs. Uh, by the fall of 1917. Now, what may be the British plans at the time? Well, to be honest with you, Great Britain did not have any plans. Uh, Great Britain, large empire, small army, most of its militaries overseas taking care of its colonies, big navy to go ahead and ship natural resources back to England and, and finish goods out to the colonies. They really didn't want to be involved in a large war in Europe. And so they did not, they go into the war without any, any grand plan. And then Austria-Hungary essentially, based on its history, assumed that war would be fought in the Balkans. And so they figured, well, we just, you know, we had the, the first and second Serbian wars. We'll just have a third Serbian war. And then a little bit later on, they decided, well, we probably need to have two plans. So, eh, let's have a plan for fighting in the Balkans, and then let's have a plan, a plan for fighting with the Russians. And essentially, those are its, uh, its major plans. So here we are, July 28th. 1918, 1914, sorry, and the war begins. Uh, commanders, again, not paying attention to what happened to the Russian-Japanese War of 1904, uh, believing in the strength of their soldiers and the spirit of the bayonet, they begin to attack. And as we all know, failing to take into consideration results of mass machine guns and artillery. And so by the fall of 1914, uh, People are running out of resources in terms of uh, shells and machine gun bullets and all of that kind of stuff. Um, by the end of the Battle of the Marne, France has suffered more than 950,000 casualties. Uh, the Brits have 90,000 casualties. And the Germans, some 800,000 casualties. And so the commanders do what the commanders do best, which is they make an adjustment, and then we get them back in the trenches. And so. Um, we begin to see the, the development of the trench system and the idea that uh, you, you'll be able to rapidly move forward, bypassing enemy positions and enveloping your enemy from a flank. Uh, uh, the idea of an offensive operation such as that is beginning to die very slowly on the Western Front. Um, in right after the Battle of the Marne, uh, von Mulkey, the head of the German army, is replaced. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm loses a little bit of faith in his ability. And he's replaced by a general named Eric von Falkenheim. And so Baron von Falkenheim, General Falkenheim, is going to go ahead and set the stage for what's going to happen for the next two years. And so let's kind of take a quick look at where we are in 1915. Um, general Falkenheim really believed that um, the war should be prosecuted on the, in the Western Front. Um, he also thought that negotiations should continue with the Russians and maybe the Russians would except a negotiated settlement, allowing him to move his forces from the Eastern Front. Um, 
However, since the Western Front, the attack in the Western Front failed, whereas the attack and the defense in the east by generals uh, uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff were successful, uh, Falkenheim really doesn't have the uh, the sway with the, with the Kaiser to go ahead and get him to uh, to continue the war on the Western Front. So on the Western Front, the Ger- you know German army is going to basically defend, and on the Eastern Front, essentially uh, Germany and Austro Hungary are going to uh, essentially uh, attack again into what's now present day Poland. Uh, Allies, obviously, looking back on 1914. Probably didn't go as well as they anticipated, uh, driven by different desires or needs. France was uh, upset or terrified would be the better word. The fact that the war is being fought on French territory in their agricultural uh, lands that they need to feed their, their nation, their state. And so, uh, and then for national pride, they want to go ahead and have some offensive operations. And so essentially, the Allies... The Allies are going to conduct three basic uh, offensive operations on the Western Front uh, in 1915. Uh, as a summary, overall, none of them are very successful. Um, it's the Brits. I mean, they're they're essentially trying to seize territory. Um, not very effective. Uh, the Brits will be the fir- the Brits in 1915 will be the first to go ahead and use massed artillery in preparation for an offensive operation. Uh, which they attempt to do in September. Uh, the problem was is that the one is they ran out of uh, ran out of ammunition about which they fired their initial barrage, and then afterwards it took the British five hours before they left the trenches, uh, thus giving the Germans enough time to go ahead and uh, come out of their trench or come out from the secondary trenches and move their way back into into their trenches. So essentially, in the, on the Western Front in 1915. Uh, the Germans are on the defense and they're observing what the, the Allies are doing to them. And so this first change in doctrine, remember 1914 until mid-1915, it's attack, attack, attack. Now in 1915, we see the first uh, change in um, in German tactics. And they come up in June of 1915, which is something called defense in depth. And so uh, the principles that you'll see along the left side, I'm not going to go ahead and, and, and reread them, but essentially they're they're responding to what the Allies are doing to them. And they're realizing that with this artillery fire, this massive artillery fire, that if you leave your troops in the frontline trenches, they're just going to be decimated, right? And so you, what you need to do is, again, you, why not have a secondary trench or put something a little bit further back that allows the uh, soldiers to, to get out of uh, artillery fire. They also, again, highly stress the idea for a counterattack. Anybody who knows who's been on the defense uh, once you've been pushed out of the defensive position, your opponent is as weak as you are, and it's necessary for you to counterattack as quickly as possible. And so they begin to develop a tactic for moving their forces forward quite quite quickly to go ahead and do that counterattack. And then, obviously, they under- come up with the idea of a reverse slope defense, right? So if you've got a small hill, uh, you put your position on the backside of the hill to protect it from direct in- artillery fire. Uh, and then allowing and then forcing the, the opponent to come over the crest of the hill where they make better targets. And then they can't uh, they cannot uh, gain the benefit from friendly or from their artillery fire because you're on the on the backside. So this is um, the doctrine that is going to be uh, put into uh, put into play uh, in 1915, the remaining part of 15 and early into 1916. So we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about 1916. So as we're all well aware of, um, General von Falkenheim, Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, wants to shift focus back to the Western Front. So he is going to uh, get the Kaiser's okay to go ahead and uh, conduct a major offense. And so he looks around the Western Front and he picks Verdun. And so he decides on Verdun for historical as well as practical reasons. One, it was a salient. Two, it was near a large railroad system. Uh, and three, it held great prestige for the French. And so he decided that he wanted to go ahead and conduct an offensive operation against Verdun. Now, one of the things that he had learned in uh, the 1915 was uh, the, the requirement to use a massive artillery. So he's going to fire essentially one million shells on the first day into Fort Dudamont. And so in the upper right hand corner, that's Fort Dudamont before. And afterwards, that's Fort Dudamont afterwards. Um, 
upward of 40 million shells will be fired during this particular, uh, we would say campaign nowadays, but then, back then they called it a battle. And essentially, the other thing that kind of changed was that uh, Falkenheim realized that um, it was going to be very difficult beating, driving the French and the, and the British out of their trenches. And so they, he began this war of attri attrition that we're most familiar with. If I can kill a lot of Frenchmen and they're not producing enough babies to go ahead and fill the army, I can get the French to, to sue for peace. And so that is really the objective of uh, the Verdun campaign, the Verdun battle is to go ahead and bleed the uh, French white. Um, which they do a pretty good job. I think my numbers indicate that um, France is going to lose about 355,000 casualties and Germany is going to lose about 400,000 casualties. And so it's going to be, while it's not a tag, that while it's not a victory for the Germans, it's certainly going to go ahead and pin down a lot of assets and a lot of resources uh, that the French need. Um, they're, you know, the French are moving forces, uh, units into and out of Verdun, and so they appeal to the, the Brits. They ask for British assistance to attack in the West. We all know then that the British agree to move their attack forward a month, and so in July of, six, uh, of 16, we launched the Battle of the Somme. Uh, again, uh, another massive use of artillery. I think it's 1.75 million artillery rounds fired on the first day. Um, the Germans, employing that, cha that doctrine change from 1915, a relatively unscathed from this artillery uh, barrage. Uh, they're in these deep concrete reinforced bunkers. Uh, the Germans come back up out of the bunkers after the, attack, after the artillery lifts, and uh, they deal with the British will have, uh, what, 60,000 casualties on the first day. And so that, this, the Somme will continue for another couple of weeks. Again, the only thing that really produces other than an overexpenditure of ammunition is casualties. And so uh, the Brits are going to lose about, what, 420,000. The Germans are going to lose about 445,000. The French will lose about 250,000. So the, the forces, you know, the militaries are going to leave here at the end of 1916. And they're going to start thinking about, OK, this is really not working for us. I mean, we've got a defensive plan. And we've got the organization, all the rest that go with it, but we're just not making any headway in terms of what it is we want to obtain. And so in the fall of 16, I think it's December of 1916, they're going to make their next shift in their, uh, their tactical doctrine. And it's called the Elastic Defense in Depth. And so... It's no, the focus is no longer on holding territory. The focus is now forcing the attacker, the attacker to cover the, come across that open terrain, expose himself, and then use his resources by the time they get to the first or even the second trench. Um, it's no, again, no longer retaining terrain is no longer the, the, the objective. It's you know, depleting the enemy's resources. And in order to do that, German commanders are essentially guided by these four principles which is, and you can read them as you go along, I'm not going to consult your uh, intelligence. And the inter and, and interesting thing uh, is that last bullet. The Germans introduced these, that bottom bullet talks about three successive zones. So you got the outpost zone, which are the listening posts, LPs and OPs, uh, observation posts, listening posts. You got the battle zone, which is where the primary uh, first and second line trenches, a lot of the uh, hardened bunkers are. And you got that rearward zone. Uh, all of those serving in the military, in the army, I think, will realize that that is almost exactly the way that the U.S. Army is organized today, except that we obviously have changed the name of these zones. And so the, the, the outpost zone is now called the deep zone, or the deep area. Battle zone is the close area. Rearward zone is the consolidation and support area. So even our army here, 100 years after the end of the First World War, is still using incorporating doctrine that was designed uh, by uh, the Germans way back in 1916, early 1917. So, um, in um, let's check. So, in August of um, 1917, General von Hulk Falkenheim is relieved of command. Um, Verdun has proven to be much more of a disaster than that he had. For, he had briefed the Kaiser on. And so he's replaced by the, the 
dynamic duo, right? Hindenburg, Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff will now assume command of the uh, of the German army, right? And so essentially, they're going to take a look, at, you know, they're going to be the ones that are driving this elastic defense and depth of change and tactical doctrine. Uh, they're going to be looking at how do we go ahead and, and use the resources that we have available to ourselves. And what are they going to be able to do to go ahead and to, to set aside or set themselves up for what they know is going to occur in 1917, which would be the Allied spring uh, uh, attacks, right? And so one last note before I move on to 1917 is we've all seen the movie 1917, right? And so one of the things that uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff do is they look at the Western Front. And they realize it's been fought over for uh, two and a half years. And, you know, it's incredibly destroyed. Infrastructure's gone. Uh, there's nowhere to hide, nowhere to, to, to hook the cover. So they're going to withdraw several miles back towards Germany, back towards Belgium, and they're going to dig in it in what was then referred to as the Hindenburg Line. And so in the movie 1917, that's really what the premise is, is that the Germans have withdrawn to another line and that the, the British forces are then attacking a Vimy Ridge in support of the Neville Offensive. So that movie 1917 occurs here at the beginning of 1917 and is really a result of uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff taking over the army and deciding that they need to pull back to better to better terrain. All right, I will try forward. So I'm not going to go ahead and talk about all of this, I think, but we all know that, you know, as, as the museum talks about in great detail, and I think a really good job is 1917 is that swing year, right? And so you got several things that occur. Um, essentially, America declares war on Germany, which now means that the Americans are going to start producing an army which will eventually make its way to Europe. And so the Germans are concerned about these millions of fresh bodies being thrown in, against them in the Western Front. Um, we're familiar with the Neville Offensive and how badly that went. Uh, the mutiny within the French army that occurs right after that. Uh, essentially, the uh, you know, subsequent attacks by both the French and the British will gain some territory, but they're not going to go ahead and um, obtain the desired effect of getting the uh, the uh, Germans out of the war. And then the fact that by December, the Russians are out of the war, thus freeing up the armies that they had on the Eastern Front, uh, making them available for redeployment and essentially movement to the, uh, to the Western Front. And so in the late of 1917, early part of 1918, the, uh, the Germans, in this case, it's General Ludendorff, who's the driving force, is going to make a change again to their tactical doctrine, and it's going to go back to an offensive doctrine as opposed to the last two changes. And he develops what's now called the, the attack in position warfare. And as it says there, essentially, um, it's based on all of the lessons learned during the, the 1914 through the through 1917. Uh, it's also taken into consideration that something needs to be done quickly to put the Allies out of the war before the Americans go ahead and get forces on the battlefield. And the idea is to develop, instead of you know, attacking on a 30-mile front, they're going to attack on a very small front. The, the, the idea is, no, is to penetrate the enemy line as quickly as possible, move our stormtroopers or move our elite troops quickly through the, the penetration, have them drive further back into the Allied rear areas, um, and then being followed up with uh, conventional regular infantry units, which would then do the mopping up. Uh, the goal being is to seize as much, you know, destroy as much enemy as possible, uh, disrupt their communications, and then get in their rear area where they can go ahead and start um, wrecking havoc. And so that is what they're going to go ahead and put into, uh, into play in the spring of 1918. Again, General Ludendorff, he's not the, he's not the basis, he's not the sole author of this doctrine. Um, he never claimed credit for it. He had a very, he was very good at what he did. He had a very good staff. Um, he used his staff officers to gather information. Uh, I read an anecdotal uh, story that even while the battles were taking place in 16 and 17, staff officers were arriving at division headquarters asking for, what's the lessons learned from the battle that you're undergoing right now? And so he was, in a way, even driving his, his the, is the junior headquarters staff's crazy, but the, the goal was to learn as much as you could from each engagement so that they could go ahead and take that and turn that into the new doctrine. So it was a staff effort. Uh, 
that came up with that 1918 uh, uh, doctrine. Now, obviously, with a new doctrine, more offensive and less defensive, we're going to go ahead and make changes to uh, a lot of those things that I talked about when I defined what doctrine changes, organization, manpower, education, and all of that. So first up will be uh, their divisions. So they're going to reorganize, essentially, their divisions. Uh, they're going to have a, a few less men. Uh, essentially, uh, one is because they don't they need a, a smaller number for what they got planned, and two is they're having a hard time refilling or replacing those that have died. Uh, horses remain about the same. Uh, they're going to go ahead and create new technology. One of that one of that weapon systems will be the light machine gun, the MG eight zero eight fifteen. Um, they're going to kind of get rid of most of the heavy artillery and bring that up to a higher level, but they're going to go ahead and give the German divisions um, more light artillery and more horses in order to go ahead, or more modes of transportation in order to move that light artillery around the battlefield. Um, and they're also going to give them uh, more mortars as well. So they're going to give more firepower to the division. They're going to make it a little bit lighter, with the, with, again, with the idea that uh, the German divisions are going to go ahead and penetrate in a narrow position, you know, attack a narrow uh, position across from them and then penetrate, push everything through. Um, I've noticed that I really, I really haven't talked about stormtroopers, even though that was part of the, the title. And so let me briefly you know, take a half step away from it. So the idea of, of Strasstruppen or stormtroopen uh, doesn't really begin in 1916, 17 or 18. It actually began in 1915 in the Bavarian unit. Uh, it was a it was a, a small unit Bavarians. Uh, they were not infantry; they were pioneers or engineers, essentially, and they were created to go ahead and do special missions for the division commander. Um, in uh, sorry, let me catch my notes. Yep. So in 1915, they create that. They expand that a little bit. 19 uh, in 1915, but in the in the as early as the time that Hindenburg takes charge of the German army in uh, August of 1916, he, he Ludendorff says, hey, well, I want every division to create a stormtroop battalion. Uh, the stormtroop battalion were, uh, were, were highly motivated. Uh, they all had to be young men under the age of 25. They had to be unmarried. Uh, they received special training. They received special promotions, special pay. Uh, they got the best food. And they were, again, highly trained. The idea was that, that these battalions are going to be the, stock, the shock troops or the storm troops for what's going to happen a little bit later on. And so these, these units, the, uh, the storm troop units, are created essentially standing up in, in, uh, in 1916. And then uh, uh, they will become the basis for the attack and position warfare doctrine that comes up a little bit later on. Uh, in addition to the machine guns, light machine guns, uh, they're going to take the standard German rifle, cut it down a little bit, make it more uh, a light, a lighter, a lighter weight, so they can carry it a little bit further. And they're also going to issue the German soldiers uh, shotguns, which they can use in their attacks. And so that's we begin to see the use of, of stormtroops be essentially put into into doctrine here in the attack and position warfare. Uh, it's going to affect their training <clears throat> in the. You know, winter of 1917, 1918, all of these, you know, a lot of these stormtroop units are going to undergo a training and they're going to become uh, competent with the weapon systems that they have and the idea of them attacking forward. Uh, I found this one interesting. And again, Charlie, this is probably a staged photograph as well. But these are Ottoman Turkish stormtroopers undergoing training under German officers in the rear. And so even the Ottoman Turkish Empire is going to go ahead and create these stormtrooper units. Um, again, change in doctrine, change in weapon systems. And so the next couple of slides are going to little, talk a little bit about uh, some of the weapons they're going to have. So first up is hand grenades. Obviously, hand grenades have been around since the beginning of the war. Uh, Germans essentially had the two. They had a stick grenade and the egg grenade. Uh, developed in 15, 16, the final version of the, of the hand grenade uh, is a 1917 version, which is what you see here. But what's going to happen is they're going to end up giving the stormtroopers are going to carry lots and lots of hand grenades with them. They're going to use them for what you get essentially going to use hand grenades for, which is to uh, overcome machine outposts, uh, machine gun nests, command control centers. They're going to chunk a bunch of grenades, move on, and let the troops falling along behind them uh, clean up behind them. 
And so, again, photograph, probably obviously staged, uh, a lot of them carrying the 1917 Stelhan Grat. Next one is the machine gun. I've already alluded to it. Um, they take the standard uh, machine gun air, uh, 60 pounds, I think, crew of six. They're going to turn it into a lightweight, a, a lighter, not a lightweight, a lighter weight machine gun. Um, it effectively weighs about 33 pounds. Uh, they kept the water cooled jacket on it. You see here, uh, put a, a basic stock on it. Crew goes to four men. But the idea is, is that instead of being stuck in a position on a trench when the enemy, you know, when you're attacking, the machine guns are going to move forward with you and machine guns will be able to support you. So again, they create the MG08 slash 15. And again, what, 180 of these will be given to each division to accompany of the stormtroops as they move forward. Uh, next one is flamethrowers. Uh, everybody, you know, Germans have been using flame floor, flame throwers, sorry, uh, since 1914. Again, specialized pioneer units were the only units that uh, that actually carried the flamethrowers, and they were used in the siege tech, uh, tactics. Um, started with the company under the command of a, a guy who came up with the idea, and by the time that the spring offensive of 1918, they're going to actually have a a flamethrower regiment uh, so that units will be broken down and will accompany stormtroops as they move forward in, in the assault. Uh, they have the, they have two basic designs. The, the one that we remember from World War II are the two tanks on the guy's backs. This happened to be a smaller version. It's called a WEX. Uh, this is a little bit more easier to move around the battlefield with, but they're going to go ahead and incorporate uh, specialized troops with um, with these flamethrowers to go ahead and uh, help them in the assault. Uh, next couple of things that they're going to add to their uh, doctrine is going to change this. The doctrine is going to drive uh, is this, and it's kind of a busy slide, so let me walk through real fast. And so upper left-hand corner, this concept of close air support that, you know, German aircraft are going to be used to clear the way for attacking German infantry. Uh, how do we command and control that? How do you ensure that the aircraft are striking at the same time? Uh, all of that is going to be developed so that when they attack in 1918, uh, the airplanes are going to be there. The aircraft are going to be there to go ahead and uh, attack their assault or protect their assault. Um, probably not sure if you can see that, but uh, upper left-hand photograph, uh, he's wearing the stormtroops wearing a gas mat, a protect a respirator. He's carrying a submachine gun. I forgot to mention they were also developed. And this guy over here on the left, he's got over his shoulder, he's carrying all of his grenades. So uh, German stormtroopers are going to go ahead and carry that equipment, be supported by uh, their aircraft as this Peyton depicts. The, the Mentioned that they're gonna start moving artillery forward. You know, earlier, up until 1918, the artillery stayed in one position. Once the infantry got past the range, sorry about that. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna, the Germans are gonna move their art artillery pieces and light artillery pieces, they're going to move them much farther forward so that as the stormtroopers continue to advance uh, into the enemy, into their enemy's rear, they'll be supported by the field artillery that's following closely along behind them. So here you see they've built a ramp over the trench system and the gun crew is moving its piece uh, across into the battlefield. Um, and I believe this is obviously for training. And then the other thing that Germans are going to do is they're going to muster what they can Bottom left-hand corners are hundreds of thousands of German troops moving forward to uh, the uh, the Western Front. Most of them, as I said, were released from the Eastern Front and they trained and they're moving forward. Up here in the upper right-hand corner, they're gonna stockpile millions and millions and millions of artillery shells. And then bottom right-hand corner, they're gonna deliver everything that they can using whatever means necessary from horse-drawn wagons, in the back you know, is trucks, and then you've got the vehicles as well. And so by uh, 1918, before they begin the spring offensive in March, the, the Germans will have developed a new doctrine and will have changed organization, personnel training, leadership equipment, all of that. So they're prepared for uh, the spring offensive of 1918. I'm not going to go through it in great detail. Uh, suffice it to say that it begins on the 21st of March, goes until the 18th of July. Um, it essentially consists of uh, these five operations. Uh, first operation, Operation Michael, very successful. The Allies were not really prepared for this uh, 
the new doctrine, uh, small units pushing through very quickly, getting into the rear areas as quickly as possible. And so they're going to make gains of about 255 kilometers over overall. They're going to essentially capture an estimated 90,000 POWs, both British and, uh, and French uh, soldiers. Um, so initially very successful at a tactical level. However, there's no, there's no major headquarters, no railroad units, nothing behind that. Going to prove to be not a strategic or a, a grand tactical uh, success, but it will create a, a potential a gap in the, in the Allied line. So that's followed by Operation Georgette, essentially to go ahead and push British forces back. Uh, the goal was to seize the, the railhead uh, in the, the British rear area. Um, this attack proves to be less than successful. And so, um, again, he's kind of wasted, Ludendorff's kind of uh, wasted his forces by attempting to, and then failing to grab the, the railhead in the north. Uh, Blucher York is uh, 27 May. This is going ahead, trying to build on the gains from Operation Michael in, in March. Fairly expensive. Uh, they get within 90 miles of Paris, uh, scare the be heck out of uh, the French and the, and the Allied headquarters. But essentially, um, that's about, they're going to kind of begin petering out here. And then um, Operation, who's I'm not going to try to pronounce it because my German's really bad, that produced to be a complete waste. And then it's followed up by the last one, which also essentially fails. By, by the middle part of June and part of the July, the Germans have really shot their bolt. Um, Stormtroopers, uh, trained units, motivated, all this equipment, they have a high casualty rate. So uh, once they're dead or wounded, they're not going to be available for the next operation. So this, uh, the whole idea of the Ludendorff offense or, or the Kaiser Schlock, uh, good idea. However, at the tactical level, at the operational slash grand tactical level, it is not going to prove to be very effective. And so what happens, as we all know, is that the Germans go on to defense and the Allies begin their offensive and the war begins to run down. So. Um, Change in the doctrine, it was probably a good idea. However, it uh, did not generate the results that uh, Ludendorff was looking for. So again, we got those tactical gains without a strategic or an operational level breakthrough. Uh, they gained, like I said, a lot of territory. They captured a lot of soldiers. They grabbed a lot of equipment. But the bottom line is that didn't really mean that much. By the time that the spring offensive is over, they're incapable of re regaining the initiative. And so, as I mentioned, they go on defense and they lack the resources to ever take the offense again. And then eventually this political, economic and social conditions within Germany are gonna go ahead and uh, force the government after the Kaiser uh, abdicates uh, to sue for peace with the, the allies. And so um, a great idea, slightly poor in the execution and did not gain the, uh, gain the goals that it was intended to do. That was, then we all know. Then you get to the war ends, Treaty of Versailles, uh, trying to get in, talk a little bit about how the war ends for the Germans. Uh, you know, they lost all their overseas colonies and they lost the, uh, the, the Rhine River Valley, which was the industrial heart of Germany, uh, limited the size of its army and Navy, took away all its naval vessels. Uh, forbade an air force. Uh, this photograph right here in the upper right, um, I had to cut that down to fit it in the screen, but there has to be at least several thousand German airplanes that have the wings cut off, the engines taken out of, and all just put here in this, this large uh, boneyard for, for air, uh, airplanes. Um, they were directed essentially to go ahead and conduct wartime trials against the Kaiser, but they never did that. And then, as you're all well aware of, well aware of sorry, they're are required to pay uh, reparations for uh, all the war losses. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting when I first started working at the, or volunteering at the museum was um, somebody asked me, hey, did the Germans ever pay off their World War I debt? And yes, they did. Uh, it was eventually paid off on 3 October of 2010. Um, in researching that, I also found that the Germans were paying the war debt 1939 and 1940 when they realized they needed the money elsewhere <laughs> when they stopped paying until the end of World War II. But, uh, but no, the, the Germans did pay their award that it just took them a few years to get it done. 
so the war ends. Germany's defeated. Other central powers are out of the picture. Uh, all of these uh, restrictions are placed on the on the German military, the German people. Um, we're all familiar with the rise of Hitler and the fact that uh, even though you know the the German army was victorious for the most part during the spring offensive, uh, they didn't do very well during the Allied offensive. But the the German military leaders, Hitler for the most part, will go ahead and, and seize upon the fact that they, hey we were successful in 1980. We were stabbed in the back by the politicians, the communists, the the king and the Kaiser and all of that. So a lot of bad feelings are going to continue, obviously, during the, the interwar years for uh, for Germany. And so let me kind of briefly talk about the, the interwar years. So one of the things I mentioned is that the, their army was supposed to be downsized. And so uh, Germans, not a problem. We, we can solve, we can overcome that hurdle. So what they do is they enlist officers, non-commissioned officers, soldiers into the army. They bring them in, they conduct basic training, uh, they send them to a unit, they conduct unit training, and after about a year, maybe two years max, they have them leave the army, and then they bring in a whole new crop of soldiers. And so uh, they're within the number of restrictions placed on by the Allies, but they're bringing more people in in a shorter period of time. So that by the time the war begins in 1939, um, almost everybody has had military service of some sort. Um, they were not allowed to have a general staff because the, the Allies believed it was a general staff that uh, convinced the, the Kaiser to invade. And so the Germans say, OK, we don't have a general staff. They just called it another name and they allowed the staff to function the same way it did. They just didn't call it a general staff and nobody called them on that. Um, uh, the Russians, much to their dismay by 1941, uh, the Russians are going to go ahead and do provide a lot of training uh, to German uh, officers, non-commissioned officers, parachutists, pilots. And so they're going to go, the Germans will go elsewhere for that training that they need. And um, and even before uh, Hitler comes to power and there's the, the, uh, gives rise to the Hitler Youth, there's a program run by a German general essentially that provides military training to youth uh, in preparation, in preparing them for eventual service in the military, which they go into several years, uh, a couple of years later. Um, the Air Force is going to go ahead and develop itself. They'll use gliders, essentially, that's the upper photograph here in the upper left, to go ahead and train their pilots. And then, as we're all well aware of, the German pilots are going to go ahead and fight in the uh, Spanish, uh, sorry, Spanish. Anyway, the, war, the Franco's War in Spain in 1930s, sorry, uh, reaching of that age. Um, and so the, essentially the inner warriors are going to go ahead and, and the Germans are going to use the inner warriors to go ahead and develop their militaries, whereas England is going to hide behind its oceans and develop its navy. France is going to hide behind the Maginot Line. And America, quite frankly, is not going to pay much attention to what's going on in Europe after the First World War. And so the Germans are going to use the inner warriors to go ahead and prepare for, for the next war. So talk a little bit about re regards to Blitzkrieg. A um, couple interesting things on this, and then we'll go ahead and kind of wrap it up. One is that it wasn't the official doctrine of the German army in 1939. Um, the German army had gone back to a uh, offensive nature, kind of relying on what they had used in 1914. Um, they were still kind of in the, in the idea of how the battles were fought on the Western Front. In, in the in the in the first world war and then the the idea Guderian and the other military leaders who come up with the idea of panzers tanks and blitzkrieg and lightning war all of that is really a generational thing it's the the, the army you know the guys who were regiment and division and corps and army commanders wanted it the way it was in 1914 and the younger company grade officers who had fought in the trenches and saw what it was life in the trenches was like, they were the ones that were asking for a different way of war. And they were the, uh, the, 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 uh, the folks who, who followed along uh, Guderian and uh, Mens, uh, von Manstein, essentially. And so if you look at it, if, and again, we're not, you know, it's World War I Museum, not World War II, essentially the, the, you know, the, the concept of Blitzkrieg or the, what, the way the Germans wanted to go war almost failed in 1939 when they invaded Poland. Um, not nearly as successful as they thought it was going to be. And so that 
during that phony war between the fall of 39 and the invasion of France in, 19, in May of 1940, they're going to really, you know, uh, further develop this idea of Blitzkrieg. And it's really, it's not until, uh, um, and I forget exactly who it was that, that got Hitler's ear, but eventually it was uh, uh, when they were able to convince Hitler that Blitzkrieg, this lightning war was the way to go, that allowed them to go ahead and use the, a lot of the ideas that they had learned in the spring offensive of 1918, which then allows them to develop these military cap capacities, which allowed them to conquer Western Europe, almost all of Western Europe by the by the fall of 1940, uh, by, sorry, by the fall of 1940, my apologies. And so um, in a way, I believe that it really was the Germans who, who, who made the most of the interwar years to change the, their doctrine, uh, which then changed the, all the other aspects of it, and which uh, allowed them to go ahead and do fairly well early on in 1940. Uh, of course, the problem with that was is that they ended up having the same situation that they had in 1914, which is war on two fronts, and it kind of get them up a little bit later on. All right, so let me go ahead and try to wrap all this up. So um, the evolution of doctrine occurs, and as Charlie said early on, Germans aren't the only ones, English, the French, Americans eventually will also change their doctrine, but I just wanted to kind of focus on the German doctrine. And that doctrine allowed them to, uh, to, to be a fairly, you know, from a fairly efficient military here in 1914 to, uh, Equipping and training and preparing their stormtroopers for the uh, for the spring offensive of 1918, and that a lot of the ideas and the beliefs and the uh, and the lessons learned from the, the hard battles of 1918 will be put to use here in 1940 as the the German military overwhelms almost all of Western Europe. And so, with that, these are some of my references. And there's obviously lots and lots and lots of stuff out there, but uh, these are the main ones that I pulled from. And with that, I will say thank you for your kind attendance, and I apologize for the cough. And are there any questions at this time? Mike, I have a thought about the <laughs> offensive of 1918. Um, you know, we do divide war into strategic, operational, and tactical. And my thought is that while the battle, the, the battles of 1918 were great tactical victories for the Germans, I would submit that that was not only a strategic failure, but it was an operational failure because their operational goals at the, certainly at the core uh and army level was to A, take the channel ports, B, capture the railroad junctions in France that would allow them to progress further, and arguably C, to capture the line of the Marne, which would then allow them to threaten Paris. They achieved none of those. No, exactly. That's a good point. I mean, I think and it's exactly, I think what occurred is that, and it, I, before I began the research, this when I used to talk to the students about uh, the spring offensive, and I jokingly, and I really shouldn't have talked about it that way, but that's exactly the way you described it is what occurred. When they got back into the rear area, and I forgot to highlight it in the one slide, the other thing that they captured along with the prisoners and the English equipment is Irish whiskey and French wine. And so a lot of those units uh, they couldn't find enough sober soldiers to continue the advance because the Germans had hadn't been drinking anyway. So that's that's not the only reason, though. But uh, I think they failed to understand just how deadly this tactic was going to be. I mean, the the as they mentioned, the casualties that they took uh, meant that they kind of ran out of steam when they ran out of steam, and they did not able they were not able to capture uh, any of their operational or strategic objectives. Yeah, so. I think is a very fair criticism of it. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. Uh, it's been a great, uh, a great session, and we'll see you guys next month.